good morning. Good to see everybody. I'm glad that you are all able to squeeze in and make room for one another this morning. Um, so yeah, it's pretty pretty slim, which we expect, and, and that, that leads me into a couple of our announcements here this morning. Um, you know, first off, again, with everything going on with COVID, we do have um, many cases in our church family, uh, and then we also have uh, quite a bit that's been exposed as well. Um, so we appreciate those that are being cautious and uh, not taking any chance, not risking anything. Uh, and that's what we want to encourage you to do. If you feel like you've been exposed, uh, stay at home, quarantine, um, don't risk bringing anything. So we appreciate those that are doing that. We want to continue to pray for those in our church family again that have COVID and been exposed to it. Uh, pray for a speedy recovery for them and the treatment plan that has been set forth for them as well. Uh, so again, which, and if you feel like you may have symptoms, you feel like you may have it, again, we also ask you to stay at home. And so we want to welcome those that are joining us online. And again, you can join us online on Facebook for live, and then on YouTube, it's uploaded at a later time. Again, YouTube, just search Web Baptist Church. Uh, so far, we're the only thing that pops up every time I search it. So you should be able to find us pretty easily on there. Uh, we still are planning on moving forward with our dinner on 6 p.m. this coming Wednesday night as well. And then I want to encourage you, uh, as we get ready to start our service today, just a, a reminder for you, and I'm sure many of you are aware, but I want to encourage you to continue to pray for those in the path of the hurricane that's moving in today. Uh, we want to lift those up in the Louisiana area, uh, on into Mississippi as well. And then also I want to encourage you to continue to pray for the situation going on in Afghanistan uh, also. So I want to lift those up and continue to pray uh, we know that our God is in control, uh, and so we want to pray that he intervenes, and he intervenes in such a way that brings about good for those uh, that love him and are called according to his purpose, and he also intervenes in a way that brings him glory as well. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we get started. God, we are we're thankful for this opportunity to gather together, and we're thankful for uh, the technology that allows our brothers and sisters to also join us online. Father, I pray for us in attendance and those that are watching, that our hearts and minds would be set upon you, Lord, and you alone. Lord, we do lift up those that are in the path of the hurricane. God, we pray for uh, miraculous intervention and protection in their lives. We pray for those, Lord, that are in the midst of evilness in Afghanistan. Lord, we pray for their protection. We pray for our brothers and sisters that are there. Uh, God, that you would guard them. Um, but also, Lord, we pray for Paul-like conversions of the enemy. Father, for us today, we pray you would move and move mighty in our midst for our, um, our church family that is facing COVID. God, we pray for their healing and speedy recovery, and we pray for continued protection of our church family. Lord, we have gathered here today for your glory and your glory alone. So may it be in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing songs together to our God. I'm going to read from Lamentations this morning. And we'll get started. Lamentations chapter 3, verses 19 through 24. It says, Remember my affliction and my wanderings, the wormwood and the gall. My soul continually remembers it and is bowed down within me. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Let's stand together and sing this morning. Hymn number 139, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
Jesus loves even me. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the day. loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing. I see the great King. This shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Let's continue to worship him this morning. And number 680, all the way my Savior leads me. All the way my Savior leads me. What have I to ask beside? Can I doubt his tender mercy who through life has been my Jesus do with all things well. 
gushing from the rock before me, though a spring of joy I see, gushing from the rock before me, though a spring of joy I see, all the way my Savior passage today is found in the Gospel of Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 9. The Gospel of Mark chapter 1 verse 9 says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you for his birth, his life, his death, and his resurrection. We thank you for the hope of eternal life that we have in him and in him alone. So, Father, today I pray that our worship would be reflective of this truth. And, God, from it you would move upon our hearts and our minds. We ask this in the Son's precious name. Amen. I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. When the tempter would prevail, he will hold me fast. I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is all. saves our his delight Christ will hold me fast precious in his holy sight he will hold me fast he'll not let my soul be lost his promises shall last bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast, he will hold me fast, he will hold me fast, for my Savior loves me so, he will hold me fast, for my life. 
justice has been satisfied. He will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life. He will hold me fast. Till our faith is turned to side. When he comes at last. our singing with him number 34 he is Lord sing together with fellow believers. I pray you be with Brother Joel as he brings a message this morning that you'd be lifted up as we continue to worship in the Word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. If you will join me in Mark chapter 1. Mark chapter 1. Again, uh, a children's church at this time, by the way. A children's church, excuse me, sorry about that. Children's church. Yeah, there we go. Children's church be dismissed. And for, for us, we'll be in Mark chapter 1, starting in verse 9. Chapter 1, verse 9. We're right here at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark. And again, right now, we're, we're doing more of a, of a standalone message here, uh, still for the next few weeks before we start our next series together. Um, was preparing to talk a little bit about baptism today, but with uh, everything going on with COVID, we've kind of pushed back baptism as well. So we'll, we'll reschedule that for a coming date. Uh, but I still want to speak on the subject matter. And here in Mark chapter 1, starting at verse 9, we get to see the really is the start of Jesus' ministry and the way that he kicks it off, the, the way he begins his public ministry or he's about to start his public ministry, uh, really begins with his baptism, then his temptation, and then he begins uh, more of a public ministry to those around him. Uh, but what we're going to see here, and this is our main idea if you're following along there in your outline, the main purpose of the arrival of Christ is Jesus came to save Jesus came to save. And that's the whole overarching goal of Christ. He came for salvation. Uh, he tells Nicodemus this when he's talking to him in John chapter 3, that he came in the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Uh, that's his purpose for coming born of a virgin, born in the manger, lit his life, his death, and his resurrection was for salvation to be open to humanity. Because up to this point, we've been absolutely a failure at doing it ourselves. And so as he begins his ministry, 
at this moment of his baptism, what Jesus is declaring is that he is the Savior. So Jesus' baptism declares him as the Savior. This points to him as the Messiah, the one that has come to rescue us, to open up this path of salvation that we could not open for ourselves. And so I just want to talk a few aspects here of what Christ's baptism represents. Again, number one, it is the beginning of his public ministry. It is the beginning of his public ministry. Again, in verse 9, it says, In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John. So Jesus is leaving his hometown to begin his ministry. So he's leaving where he's known and what he's known, and he's heading out to where the public is at so that he can begin to declare the path of salvation. But I want you to note where he goes. He goes and he meets with John the Baptist, as we like to call him, or you may hear him referred to as John the Baptizer. A um, couple of things to note about John. Um, one, he's a, he's a prophet, and he's telling of the arrival of Christ. Two, he's not actually the starter of the Baptist church. Like, he didn't do that. I know some people get confused when they call John the Baptist. He didn't start the Baptist church. He wasn't first Baptist there. Like, he didn't hold, you know, casserole dinners at his house. Like, he's not, wasn't the start of the Baptist church. But uh, he's out there proclaiming this message and baptizing people, and he's calling them to repent. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He's letting them know that the kingdom is here, the Messiah is coming, salvation is about to be available to you, so you need to repent and be baptized. And so he's baptizing people. And so we have Jesus going to him and meeting John in the wilderness to be baptized. Just think about what that reflects as Jesus begins his ministry. He goes to what Scripture calls John the Baptist, this wild-looking guy in the wilderness to be baptized. Jesus tends to meet people in the wilderness. Are you with me on that? Like uh, the metaphor there, he tends to meet people in the wilderness. He, he tends to go and meet people where they're at. I mean, that's the gospel message. Jesus in the wilderness, where people have come and gathered in their lostness, seeking something that they know is greater than themselves, some greater truth, some greater salvation, knowing that they're broken, knowing that they have something to repent of, because everybody that's coming to John and his message is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. So before you can repent, you've got to know that there's something to repent of. So they know that there's a brokenness. They know that they have a lostness. They know that they have a need. And Jesus meets them where they're at. So there's a common thread among a lot of people outside the Christian church that think all religions are basically the same. They're basically the same. They're they're just a group of people looking for something bigger than themselves. They're looking for God, whether they find him in Islam or they find him in Christianity or they find him in Buddhism, Hinduism. Uh, and, and just whatever other new ism has been created in the last years. Like they're trying to find God in some path form. But, but here's the difference from the rest. Islam has their five pillars that you have to try to meet all these types of uh, religious statues in the hopes that one day you'll be able to enter into paradise and meet with Allah. And Allah is not described similar to the God of the Bible Uh, Judaism, again, following the laws, keeping the covenants and the hopes to enter into paradise. Uh, Hinduism is is striving to, again, appease the gods, the millions of gods of the universe, that right karma would come upon you and you would be reborn. And Buddhism is the goal of trying to reach an enlightenment like God in the hopes that you'll just enter into nirvana. So all of these religions are have their pathway trying to reach God. The difference in Christianity is that God didn't establish a pathway for us to reach Him. He established a pathway where He reached us. It's not us trying to climb the ladder to make it to God. It's God coming down to earth to rescue us. 
it's, it's God meeting us in the wilderness where we can't see the path and we don't know the direction to go. And we know there's something outside of it, but we don't know what it is and we don't know where to go. And it's not God calling from outside of the forest trying to give us directions out. It's Him coming into the middle of the brush and saving us from our lostness. That's the difference of Christianity from all these other religions. It's Jesus meeting us in the wilderness. Not clean your life up, fix yourself, follow these rules, and then I'll save you. It's in the middle of your lostness, your brokenness, and your sin, and all the shame that you carry, I'm going to meet you right there, and I'm going to save you in that place. And then I'll change you. I'll save you. I'll give you direction out of the wilderness. So his ministry starts in the wilderness. Secondly, the baptism of Christ identifies him with sinful humanity. It identifies him with sinful humanity. Now, when Jesus comes to John, and again, John's message is repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, and before you can repent, again, you have to have something to repent of, sin, failure, missing the mark, lack of holiness in your life. If you notice in the baptism account of Jesus, there is no repentance before baptism. There's just baptism. But why is he being baptized? What does he need to be cleansed of? What does he need to be washed of? It's, it's not necessarily Jesus needing to be cleansed or washed of anything because most certainly he had nothing to be cleansed of. He was perfect in his life. No sin, no fault to be found in him. That's clear throughout scripture and what it tells us of Christ. So there's no sin or no fault to be found in him. Then why be baptized? Well, in the baptism of Christ, what he's doing is, one, he's setting an example for the rest of us to follow, the call for us to be baptized, or the call for us to repent or be made clean or be made new. Two, it's already identifying himself uh, with sinful humanity's need for that. And three, it's already a representation of what he's going to do, his death, burial, and resurrection out of the grave. And so he's setting the scene for what the rest of his ministry is going to be right there at the beginning with his baptism. So he's able to identify with sinful humanity in establishing this path for us to understand our need of repentance, but that he's paid the way for it. We do not serve a God that is unable, unable to sympathize with us. I mean, God steps off his throne and he comes to earth and as Jesus, and he, and he lives the life, and so he faced temptation. We're going to see, if you follow next, uh, chapter, verses 12 through 13, there's the temptation of Jesus here in the Scripture. Uh, you and I face temptation. We, we face uh, uh, struggles. We face difficulties. Uh, but Jesus is tempted by Satan himself. We're, we're probably not tempted by Satan himself. His forces, his enemies, darkness, but not Satan himself. Satan is not an omnipresent being. He can't be in all places at all times. He's a created being from God, so he can only be in one location at one time. Satan himself tempts Jesus, and he withstands every last bit of the temptation. So again, there's no fault to be found in him, but yet he knows what temptation is like. He knows what sorrow is like. We read in Scripture, one of the smallest verses in Scripture, Jesus wept. Anybody know that? That Jesus wept, like, right? Like, I don't know how many of you got points for memorizing Scripture in youth group, but, like, I always went to that one. Like, I quote Jesus well. Always got points for that one in youth group. I can quote some Scripture, all right? Uh, but, yeah, so Jesus what? So, like, we see him have sorrow. We see him cry out with pain and agony from his prayer in the garden to his death on the cross. So he faces sorrow and temptation and pain and struggle, He sees sickness firsthand. So in other words, there's nothing that you and I are experiencing in this world that the God that created it cannot sympathize with it because not only did he create it, but he's also walked through it. So his baptism identifies him with what we are going to have to do and what we're facing and going through. Thirdly, the baptism of Christ connects him with John the Baptist. It connects him with John the Baptist. Again, the story that we have of John, which his birth is also foretold to his parents, and they're told that he's going to be a forerunner or someone preparing the way for the Messiah. He wouldn't be the Messiah, but he would be preparing the path for the Messiah. 
So all of John's goal in life was to proclaim a message that the Messiah is coming, so repent. The kingdom of God is at hand, the Messiah is coming, repent. He's coming, repent. He's here, repent. That is the goal, that is the mission of John the Baptist. His whole life is spent preparing the way for the Lord. He doesn't reflect back to himself. He doesn't point back to himself. I mean, he even goes to the extent of saying, I'm not even prepared to tie the shoelaces of the Messiah. Of course, not shoelaces. They had different kind of shoes. But you get what I'm saying. Like, I'm trying to help bridge the gap here. Like, like he has on Nikes, and I can't even tie them. Like, it didn't even matter if they're Velcro. I still can't do it. Like, that's how far advanced he is over me. I'm here to just prepare the way. So when Jesus comes to John and he's baptized, and the scene that we see revealed there, what Jesus is saying, the one that he's been preparing for, the forerunner that that John is, he's preparing you for me. So this moment of his baptism is a declaration that he is the Messiah. He's the one that the prophecy had told about. He's the one that all the Old Testament was pointing to. He is the Savior of the world. Fourthly, his baptism also reveals the Trinity. It reveals the Trinity. So we see it all taking place here. We have Jesus the Son, and he's come, and right here it says in verse 10, when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. That's the Holy Spirit. And then in verse 11, and a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved Son, With you, I am well pleased. So we have the Spirit descending, we have the Father speaking, and of course it's the Son being baptized. We have the full Trinity being here. I can't even begin to imagine this moment. This moment that Jesus, the eternal God, is on earth, ready to begin the mission that he's been sent for. And so in this river, he's baptized, and as he comes up, the heavens crack, the Spirit descends, and the Father speaks. This is God in his fullness, putting his stamp on this moment of what's about to come. The Trinity revealed. So we believe in one God who operates in the form of three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. Each having their roles and their mission to carry out, but all belonging as one God in perfect fellowship. Adrian Rogers once said this of the Trinity. He said, the Trinity, the doctrine of the Trinity is not beyond logic and reason, it's just above it. In other words, we can do our best to try to describe it, and we try metaphors, and we try examples, but here's the reality. All of them fall short. All of them fall short of what it really is, because this is a God who exists completely, always as the Father, always as the Son, and always as the Spirit. But one God. Now, why is this an important truth? One, it's the identity of who He is. So I want to to draw some caution to you. Because there's a lot of mainline um, churches, and I use that in air quotes, uh, mainline churches who identify as Christian, but they don't view God in this form as the Trinity. To deny the Trinity is to deny God in his fullness, completely. To deny one person of the Trinity is to deny God in his fullness. If we try to live the Christian life without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, then we have abandoned God in his entirety. To miss out on one person of the Trinity is to miss out on all of who God is. Right? So that's important. That's what it means about perfect fellowship and operation of the Trinity. So if I would challenge you, I would encourage you, um, research whatever preacher you see on TV and what he's preaching and what he's teaching and, um, and, and, and is it true to the Scripture? Is it true to the Trinity? Because if it's not, 
then he's preaching a different God than what we serve with Scripture. That's how important this doctrine is. And it's important for us to understand that it's, we need the Father at work in our lives. We need the path of the salvation, the path of salvation the Son has opened, and we need the Spirit's empowerment for us to be able to be redeemed and sanctified to follow Christ. Fifthly, the baptism of Christ displays the approval of the Father. It demonstrates God's approval. It demonstrates God's approval. So again in verse 10, it, it says the heavens are torn open. They're torn open. Up to this point in Scripture, there have been many paths in which mankind was trying to take to reach to God, much like we have today. There's the old covenant or the old law that was given and follow these and keep these and I'll, and I'll bless you and have faith in me and I'll bless you. And of course, all throughout the Old Testament, we see failure after failure after failure after failure to keep such commandments. Much like what we see today and even in our own lives. And so they couldn't keep their end of the deal. So what does God do? He says, I'm going to come as Christ, and I'm going to keep your end of the deal so that this path can be open for you. And so what I want you to note here is that at the beginning of ministry, the ministry of Christ with his baptism, which is this is the moment that really begins to declare him as the Messiah, the heavens are torn open. What we're going to see later in the story is at his death is the veil torn open. The veil that kept sinful man out of the presence of God in the temple. But at the death of Christ, the veil is torn. So what we're seeing in this moment, or what Mark is referring to here, is the heavens are torn open at his baptism because it's preparing for what's going to take place at his death when the heavens are not only torn open for Christ, but they're torn open for us. I mean, this is just the beginning of what Christ is about to do, to tear the veil so that we have access to the Father. The Father opens heaven to declare His approval on the Son, but it's foreshadowing that the Son is about to tear the veil down so that we can have access to the Father. Now we can call out to Him, and we can talk to Him, and we can pray to Him. And that when we die in Christ, we will spend eternity with Him. We see him called the Son here in verse 11. Nothing can be compared to the love of the Father for his Son. You're my Son with whom I am well pleased. Meaning the life that you lived and what I know that you're about to do, I am pleased with. See, Jesus came here to fulfill what everyone else had failed. He's the Messiah, he's the Son of God, he's the Son of Man, he is the second Adam, meaning humanity himself has failed. He is the perfect Israel, he is the perfect prophet, and he is the perfect king. At every stage of failure of mankind's effort to be religious, at every failure, Jesus has come to completely redeem it within himself. The baptism of Christ displays the approval of of the Father's ministry for Christ. But what begins to really stamp the final approval of Jesus by the Father is the resurrection. So when Christ goes to the cross, He goes to the cross as a payment of our sin. Now how do we know if the payment worked? Like how do we know? I mean think about it. We, we have... We have we have all that when we go to the grocery store and we buy groceries, right? Like, we know when the, the payment is final, right? Like, they give you the receipt, and it says, here. Or if you pay with your car and you stick it in, and then it makes the same noise that the card should make if it cancels. Anybody ever notice that? Like, doesn't that make you nervous every time? You just go, beep, beep, beep. I'm like, I know they got funds. I go put it. Anyway, like that, but like that gives you kind of a, a thought, like, okay, yeah, they're, they're okay, there's a, Finality here, like there's an approval here. You look at the screen, card accepted, approved. 
They give you the receipt. Now we know that the payment is final. What do we have for that in Jesus' death on the cross? Like what tells us that the payment was accepted? It's the resurrection of Christ. I mean, if, if Jesus truly had sin and was not sufficient enough to pay for our sin on the cross, then he would have laid dead in the grave because that's what he would have deserved for his own sin. But he lives. And he didn't die again. He didn't come out of the grave later to die. He comes out of the grave and ascends to heaven. He sits at the right hand of the Father, interceding on mine and your behalf because the veil has been torn open. The sky is open. And we have access to the Father through Christ. This is all approval that my sin has been paid for in full. Like the resurrection of Christ is the ripping of the receipt and handing to me, and there's no more debt to be paid for. Transaction completed. The Savior lives. So when Christ comes to this earth, I want you to follow me here. He didn't come to just make a way. He came because He is the way. He's not just a path to the Father. He is the path to the Father. He's not a way out of hell into heaven. He is the path to heaven. Jesus declares it himself when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through me. The baptism of Christ is the final, I mean, is the beginning stamp that his whole ministry was for our salvation. And when we're baptized, we go up in there, we go under, and we come back up. What we're saying in that moment is that I believe that Jesus is who He says He is, and I believe that the payment is paid in full, and I'm going to follow Him for the rest of my life. He has saved my soul, and I have died to my sin, and I have come out of it to walk in a newness of life. Our baptism is an outward declaration of an inward reality when we're saved. God has saved me, He's rescued me, he's redeemed me, and I'm identifying myself with Christ. Christ was baptized, I'm baptized. He's called for me to repent, I have repented. He's called me to a newness of life, I have a newness of life in him. He is my way, he is my truth, and he is my life. Do you know him today? Do you have such salvation? Do you have such hope? Are you still wandering in the wilderness, lost, in the woods and unable to find your way out? He's there. He's here. You're not as lost, or you don't have to be lost. If you're still walking that path, it's because you've missed on the way, and the way's there. The way came. The way's here. Maybe you're here today and you said, yeah, I, I've trusted in Christ, I've given my life to Him, but, but I've never been baptized and I've never saw the importance of it. Let, let me just call you. If Jesus saw it important enough to be baptized, then you better believe it's important enough to be baptized. A lack of baptism shows a lack of identification to Him. Don't, don't miss out on what this means. This, when our baptism, we're saying, I'm with Jesus, full in. I've given my life to Him. I'm identifying with Him. I want to publicly let everybody else know that I'm with Christ. If you've trusted in Him for salvation, but yet you have not done that, I, I want to call you to be baptized. It doesn't save you, but it's a reflection of the salvation in your life. So whether you're watching online or you're here today, and if you don't know Christ, if you're online, please reach out to us, mail us, email us. We would love to talk to you more about how you can trust him for Christ for salvation. But if you're here present today, Brother Cody's going to come. He's going to lead us in another worship song. And as we worship, I'll be down front. I'd love to talk with you, pray with you about salvation or about baptism, whatever it is.
whatever God's dealing with your heart today, whether you're here again or watching online, reconcile it today. Don't leave here today with a question mark. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the hope and the joy and the peace that we have in Christ and Christ alone. Lord, I pray that if there's someone here today that does not know you, God, may today be their day of salvation. May today they see the way. May they see you, Christ. May they repent, trust in you for salvation, to have the hope of eternity. For my brothers and sisters across this room, Lord, if there's someone here today that has not that has trusted in you but has not followed in obedience with baptism, Lord, I pray that as they're convicted of that, that they would want to make such a public declaration to their identity in you. Same for those that are watching online. God, I pray you move upon their hearts. They call upon you for salvation. And they seek after you in obedience with baptism. Lord, this is your church. We pray you have your way. And it's in Christ's name. Amen.